Brother Gordon, and uh, good evening, my, my dear brothers and sisters. The, uh, the prophecy of Habakkuk, which you started to uh, study, starting to study tonight, is um, a prophecy which is set towards the end of the uh, reign of the kings of Judah. And we'll be able to give it a reasonably precise date, I think, in a, in a few minutes. There's nothing known really about Habakkuk outside of the book that uh, bears his name. Uh, we're not told anything about him. In verse 1 of chapter 1, we're told the burden of Habakkuk, the prophet, which Habakkuk the prophet did see. And it's nothing really startling, I don't think, about, about that at all. Habakkuk saw a, a vision, effectively. That's what he saw. And that's the way in which God spoke to his prophets. You may remember when in Numbers chapter 12, and we had the time when Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses, that God said that he would speak, uh, he speaks unto his prophets in a vision or in a dream, but with Moses he was to speak face to face. And there's a verse in Hosea chapter 12 which says that God speaks through visions, similitudes, um, by the ministry of the prophets. So there's nothing really um, startling, I think, in, in that verse. It's a burden. It's a, a prophecy where, whereby we have the idea of a load or it's a, a doom-type prophecy. And we're just going to concentrate really on, on the first chapter. But we do need to set some of the background information, I think, because we need, really do need to set the, the scene for this, this prophecy. Now, the timing of it, I think, is, is fairly clearly given in verse 5. We'll come back to verse 5 in more detail a little bit later, because this is an interesting verse, because it's quoted by the Apostle Paul uh, when he was in Antioch in Pisidia, and it's recorded in Acts chapter 13. So we'll spend some time on that and have a look at this verse. But the important thing about it, as far as the context of Habakkuk is concerned, is that uh, the prophet says, uh, I will work a work in your days. And what was that work going to be? Well, verse 6 tells us, I will, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. So what Habakkuk is being told here by God, and therefore is expressing it to, to the rest of the, the people, is that a judgment is to take place. Uh, in Jerusalem, and the the people who are to do the, the 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 overthrow to do God's judgments are the nation of the Chaldeans. Now we know that as the Babylonians, and that they came down against Jerusalem first of all in the year BC 605. So we date the prophecy before BC 605. The condition of the nation is is pretty bad. From Habakkuk chapter one, you can pick that up. And so you have to think, well, who was around at this time on the throne? Well, the last five kings of, of Judah reigned for 31 years, three months, 11 years, three months, 11 years. And uh, the last four were all pretty bad. They're all sons or grandsons of Josiah, who was the one that reigned for 31 years, and he was a good king. His reign came to an end around about B.C. 610, 609. And although he was a good king, there are indications in contemporary prophets, and there are a number of contemporary prophets with Habakkuk, particularly Jeremiah, that the condition of the nation wasn't good. So although Josiah went about setting many reforms, the nation really didn't fully respond, or certainly aspects um, where they didn't respond, and, and there would, would have been a number of people within that, uh, that community who were not party, really, to the reforms of Josiah. And when Josiah uh, went off the scene, the next, uh, his son Jehoahaz was put on the throne by the people. Pharaoh Necho came, removed him after three months, and put Jehoiakim on the throne. And it's Jehoiakim who was on the throne when the Babylonians first came down in BC 605. It was in his fourth year. So who are the contemporary prophets around um, this time? Well, there's quite a lot, as I've said. 
There's Jeremiah in Jerusalem. There's Ezekiel over in Babylon, just a little bit after the time of Habakkuk. Daniel, just a bit after the time of Habakkuk. There's Zephaniah. And Nahum, of course, talks about the destruction of Assyria. The Syrians were uh, preceding um, the preceding power, the mighty power before Babylon uh, took over. And, and you find this, I think, in Scripture, that the end time periods, there seems to be such a lot of, of Scripture that God causes to be written at that time. So when Israel's kingdom was to end, not Judah, but Israel, several years before, 100 and, uh, 200 years before, sorry, 100, 120 years before, there was uh, Isaiah, Micah, Hosea, Amos, and Jonah, all around that time. So there's a concentration of prophets at that time, there's a similar concentration of prophets now, contemporary with Habakkuk. And then, if you think about the next judgment that was to come upon God's people, that is the judgment of AD 70, you've got a massive amount, the whole of the New Testament, apart from the book of Revelation, is all concentrated, as it were, and much of that is, is directed towards the, the judgments that were to come upon uh, Jerusalem in, in that day. So, so you get these end time periods, and we would expect there to be a lot of scripture there to, to look at. Um, because the idea is to encourage people, isn't it? That was what uh, Habakkuk was trying to do, this last attempt, almost at the twelfth hour, to, to try to get the people to change. That's part of his message. A message of warning. Um, and the message of warning is there in that verse 5 that we've already looked at. Behold ye among the heathen, uh, and regard and wonder marvellously, for I will work a work in your days. So God is saying through the prophet he will definitely do something in that time. So they had to respond, and they were given plenty of information as to what they had to do in the other uh, prophets. So we've got, I, I guess, the setting of that. Now we wonder if we want to give a precise date of Habakkuk, well, I would suggest that probably just a few years before BC 605, so maybe around about BC 610, 69, at the time of the death of Josiah might well be the case. That's probably the latest date that you could put for, for the prophecy of, of Habakkuk. And how would we divide the, um, the, the I'm not going to divide the prophecy, I just want to concentrate on chapter, chapter 1, and just look and see how we can divide chapter 1 up. And the, apart from the first verse, um, the next uh, few verses, verses 2 to 4, what you've got here is Habakkuk um, seeming to, of course he's inspired to do all of this. So it's, the, it's God inspired the prophets to say these things, even though they seem to be questioning what God is, is doing. It's God inspiring him to, to say these words. And, and he's, he's clearly, these things are written for our learning. This is for instruction for us also, as well as for the people at the time. We can see how the workings of God are, are brought out in this, in this prophecy. So he seems to be questioning why God doesn't act. And why is there a need for God to act? Well, it's because of an iniquity in the land. So that's the first four verses. And then you get the answer of God saying, well, he is going to act. He is going to bring judgments upon the people, and the Babylonians will come down. And their, uh, their action and the way in which they will execute these judgments is given in verses um, 5 to 11. So particularly uh, verses 7 to, to 9. It explains how, or verses 10, verse 10, explains how they, will, how they will behave. And we'll look again at some of these verses. And then the, the final part, so that's 5 to 11, the final part is then at chapter 12 when Habakkuk then recognizes uh, what the Chaldeans are doing, that they are in fact executing the judgments of God. And that's just like the situation uh, years before in the days of Isaiah, Isaiah, and you can turn to chapter 10 and see that the Assyrian were the rod of God's correction. Uh, they were the ones who were to come and overthrow the northern kingdom and also to overthrow much of the southern kingdom um, apart from Jerusalem, which was saved at that time. So, and that takes us up to the uh, end of chapter 1. So, so that's the, the broad um, division of the chapter.
So we'll start taking a, a look at that now in a little bit more, more detail. So then, um, Habakkuk then in verse 2 says, um, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save? And you can perhaps see here what the situation was in, in the time of Habakkuk. Uh, he was witnessing that God's ways and God's law were set aside. And it was a source of, of anxiety to him. And, and it really should be something which would affect us too. We see our country, the country where we live, the country where we are sojourning now, going into a secular mode. It's no longer a, a Christian country, is it? It's going into secular mode. And so the Bible and what God has written, uh, the only book really that is of any value in, in reality to save, um, is set completely aside. And so the laws of men su have superseded the, the laws of God. And no regard is paid at all to the God of heaven. And, and that should be a source of sadness to us. And, and just keeping our fingers in Habakkuk, we might just take a look at some words of the one of the uh, psalmist in Psalm 119, just to get an idea of the sort of attitude of mind that I think we should have when we see terrible things happening in the world, and we mean the things that are away from Almighty God's ways. And so, in Psalm 119 and verse 136. The psalmist says there, Rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. And, and it's really that kind of situation that, that should affect us, shouldn't it? We should be moved by the lack of righteousness that is in the world and be sad about it because it's not good. And God is going to change all of this. Uh, when he comes to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, even the Lord Jesus Christ. So back in Habakkuk then, you can understand now how Habakkuk is feeling. Here's this people to whom God had given a wonderful law and sent prophets to them time and time again, of which Habakkuk was one, and they refused to hear the words of the prophets. And so he's... He's concerned about it, and he's concerned about everything that he sees around him. So, what does he see? Well, back in verse 2 of chapter 1, Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. So he can see all these things happening in, in, the, in Jerusalem, or elsewhere in, in the land and he's concerned about it and therefore he says in verse 4 therefore the law is slacked and judgment doth never go forth for the wicked doth compass about the righteous now there's a number of things that we could uh, look at there therefore wrong judgment proceedeth so let's just take a, a, a look at a couple of um, a couple of things in that connection I think it might be useful to just get a feel for what this man Jehoiakim was like. And uh, interesting um, commentary on him in Jeremiah chapter 22. So in Jeremiah chapter 22, you know, he's one of the most terrible kings in, in the whole of Judah and Israel. Um, what a man is it that takes the scroll, having been read to him, and takes a penknife and cuts it up and burns it on, fi on the fire? Well, what does it say about him? Well, it's, um, it's, it introduces him, uh, not by name particularly, but in, it, you'll see that he's met, it is him that he's been spoken about. In verse 13 of Jeremiah chapter 
22. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by wrong. You can see that it carries on and it names him in verse 18. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. So, so it's Jehoiakim is the one that is being addressed here or being spoken about here. And um, what is he, who is he being compared to? He's being compared to his father Josiah in verse 15. Shalt thou reign because thou closest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father, Josiah, eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? And the implication here, clear, unmistakable implication is you are not doing that, Jehoiakim. You are not judging the cause of the poor and the needy. You are not doing judgment and justice. And so that really does fit in, isn't, doesn't it, with Habakkuk's complaint about the, the state of the nation at his day. Jehoiakim was, was the king on the throne at the time of the invasion of the land by the Chaldeans. He was the one who was um, behaving so, so badly. And it goes on to say in verse 10, But thine eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness, and for to shed innocent blood, and for oppression, and for violence to do it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, my brother, or our sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, Lord, or are his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of an ass, drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. When you go and find out what the history was of, of Jehoiakim, you'll find that he was put in chains to be taken to Babylon, but that actually never happened. What happened was he, he must have done something to really upset the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar particularly, maybe. And he was just left there outside Jerusalem, as this prophecy says. Um, and he received the burial of an ass. In other words, he was not buried. And I believe he was the only king um, that, that uh, we have recorded where he'd not had a, a burial. Uh, kings of Judah that we're, we're mentioning now. So, he wasn't a, a good example at all, and this is why the judgment came. Now, if we go to the book of Ecclesiastes, and um, chapter 8, we'll see another connection with the prophecy of Habakkuk. And uh, it's a very general point, but it's a general point which we can apply to the situation and circumstances in the days of um, of Habakkuk. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 then, and in verse 11, this is the problem, isn't it? Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And so at the time of Habakkuk and Jeremiah, they were those who were saying that good was uh, evil, and evil was good. And there was no punishment for bad behavior. So because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, then they continue in their bad ways. And that's, that seems to be the, the situation. So those words link in with um, the words we've just looked at in Habakkuk, uh, chapter 1, verse 4. And uh, also we get um, an idea of the state of things in the fifth chapter of Jeremiah's prophecy. So we can just go there quickly before we go back to Habakkuk and find out what God's response is going to be. So in Jeremiah chapter 5, and uh, again we need to understand where we are in time periods, it's exactly the same time. Jeremiah has a much longer period of prophecy, it spans 40 years, and uh, it's likely that his words here uh, were given to him to, uh, to tell the people uh, years before, a number of years before Habakkuk's um, words. And, and the reason I say that is because there is a build-up in the, in the early chapters of Jeremiah where an invader is spoken about as coming down upon the nation, but the identity of that invader is not know, made known until you get to about chapter 20. Uh, whereas in Habakkuk, we read straight away, didn't we? I work a work, and it's going to be the Chaldeans. So in Jeremiah chapter 5, then in verse 25, your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things 
from you. For among my people are found wicked men, they lay wait, as he that setteth snares, they set a trap, they catch men, and so on. Verse 28, they are waxen fat, they shine, they, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked, they judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. So that's exactly what Joachim was doing. He wasn't doing what he should have done, looking after the poor and needy of the land as the law required. But he was looking after himself. And he was building his own palaces and he wasn't paying people for, for doing the, the work. Uh, yet they prosper, or appear to prosper, and the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall not I visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? So there's um, some harsh words really spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, against the nation. So let's just go back now to Habakkuk and find out the response of God to the words of Habakkuk here, because that's how it, it, it is written. It's written where Habakkuk asks these questions. He can't really seem to understand um, what is happening, uh, why things are not happening, but God is now going to make it very clear that things are going to, to happen. So, we'll take a look at Acts 13 in a bit, but let's just look at this section first of all. And if we wanted to um, just subdivide verses 5 to 11 very slightly, what you've got here is, um, God is saying in verses 5 and 6 what he will do, and then verses 7 um, to verse 10 is describing uh, what they, that is the Chaldeans, will do. Um, maybe verse 11, maybe a possible comment on, um, on Nebuchadnezzar, which we'll come on to in a second. So, so God is saying then he's going to bring the Chaldeans upon the people um, as, as a, a means of, of judgment. And he's, he's describing what they will be like. And we mentioned that there is a, um, a number of references in, in Jeremiah which we can go and take a, a look at uh, in a second and, and see this and see the way in which uh, this invading power is described in the book of Jeremiah. But let's just read some of these verses together first of all. Verse 7, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves, and their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. And maybe there's some um, suggestion there, and you could go right the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, and you get the picture. I know we normally apply this in Deuteronomy 28, swift as the eagle flieth to the Roman power. Um, but maybe it's, it's perhaps linked with this too. Um, and, and Deuteronomy 28 is, is the warning, isn't it, for Israel, many, many years before, that if they obey, they will be blessed. If they don't, if they disobey, they would be cursed. So, we'll take a look at these references in Jeremiah, but first of all, maybe a couple of um, comments on verse 9. There they shall come all for violence, their faces shall sup up, and the idea of that, I think, is swallow up as the east wind and then they shall gather the captivity as the sand. So it seems as if you've got the idea of a wind blowing sand. And if you think of desert pictures, so it blows it all up and, and the flow of the, the wind, you get a mound of sand in an area. And it's that sort of idea, I think, is being presented to us here. And they would, in verse um, 10, at the end of that verse, they would heap up dust and take it. They won't worry about strongholds, and that might be a reference to the way in which they built mounds up against city walls to capture cities. So that's a possible explanation of, of verse 10. So let's look at some parallel references uh, in Jeremiah. Now, I say there's this picture that, that sort of comes, but I would like to uh, look at just a couple of them, because there's a number of them. But we start in Jeremiah chapter 4. <coughs> And what we're looking at this for is we're trying to see that the similarity of language between Habakkuk and Jeremiah, but the identity of the invading, destroying power in Jeremiah is not given at this point. It isn't given 
until you get, as I said, to chapter 20. So Jeremiah chapter 4 then in verse 6. Set up the standard toward Zion. Re oh, I'm in chapter 4, sorry. Um, that's where I want to be, sorry. Chapter 4, verse 6. Set up the standard toward Zion. Retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. So I know it's coming from the north, as most judgments did come from. Uh, the lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Because remember, this power was not just to destroy Israel, but it was to destroy all the nations around, and it was to take um, the entire land. It was to have form uh, an empire. The destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. Then if we get on to chapter 6 and verse 22. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. So that word raised is used in Habakkuk, isn't it? Or raise up the Chaldeans. Um, they shall lay hold upon bow and spear. They are cruel. They have no mercy. Well, again, that description is given in Habakkuk also. They ride upon horses. Well, horses are featured in Habakkuk chapter 1. They ride upon horses, set in array as men of war against thee, O daughter of Zion. And, the, and then chapter 16. There's a number of other references, but we'll just go to chapter 16 and take a look at another prophecy. And we're just going to look at verse uh, 16. Now, I know that um, we might use this, this uh, little section that I'm going to look at now uh, in a different way from how I'm going to use it. Because it's often used, isn't it, because of the two preceding verses, 14 and 15, to talk about the way in which Israel would be gathered. It seems to me to be strange to use the idea of um, them being hunted and, and and fished in verses 16 and 17, it seems more likely to me that judgment, verses 16 and 17, is talking more about the judgment of Israel, and verses 14 and 15 are almost in parenthesis about God, about what God will do with his people in the future, when he will regather them from the lands of the north. So you may uh, not see it that way, but that's, that's how I read verses 16 and 17. And we'll see in a minute that in Habakkuk, if we didn't pick it up when we read it, that there's reference to fishers. Um, so, verse 16, Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them, and after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain, from every hill, and out of the holes of the rocks. Now, that's where people go to hide, isn't it? They go to hide in those places in times of, of distress. And it says, Mine eyes are upon all their ways, they are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. So the emphasis here is on the iniquity of the people. And at first, and first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double, because they have defiled my land, they have filled mine inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. So we've gone there because that is a continuation of the picture that Jeremiah is building up, like that of Habakkuk, and particularly because when we go back to Habakkuk now, chapter 1, um, I don't want to cover this last section just yet, but I just want us to notice that at the end of the, the chapter, starting with verse 14, Habakkuk is using the idea of a fisherman. A fisherman which catches people either with a hook or with a net. Um, and this idea of catching them as a fisherman is, is not to, to gather them, other than for, to gather them for the purposes of judgment. So you can see that in verse 15. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net. So that's all I want us to notice uh, just at that point. And that's why I've linked that with Jeremiah chapter 16. So let's take a, um, a look now then, going back to the uh, beginning of this middle section. So that's verses 5 and 6. And just see how this is being used by the Apostle Paul in, um, in 
Acts chapter 13. And we need to look at that. We need to think about the, uh, the way in which it's used there and the differences that appear to be there in the quotation. So we'll go to um, Acts 13 in, in a minute. Um, I just want us to, before we do, I just want us to notice the language in verse 5 of um, I will work a work in your days which you will not believe though it be told you. So here's something that people find incredible to believe. Uh, wouldn't think it could possibly happen. And God is doing a work. So it's an unusual work, really, isn't it? It's an unusual work. So I'm going to go to Acts 13 in a minute, but I want to go to a couple of references in Isaiah. And uh, I want us to notice these. Isaiah 28, where similar words are used. And we just take verse 21, first of all. Isaiah 28 and verse 21. So we're going to be, God is talking about judgments, and he says in verse 21, the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim, that's when he uh, rose up to help David defeat the Philistines. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that's when Joshua was um, helping the Gibeonites destroy the kings that came against them. That he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now therefore be not mockers, lest your, hand, lest your bands be made strong, for I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption even determined upon the whole earth. Now the, the context is judgments against the people of God for disobedience. Um, and it's a strange act because normally when God has fought, been battles, he's fought on the side of Israel. But this is strange because he's fighting against Israel. Chapter 29, verse 1. Woe to Ariel, Ariel, the city where David dwelt. So judgments against Jerusalem. And in verses 13 and 14. For the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips to honour me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men, therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvellous work amongst them among this people. So this people occurs in verse 13 and in verse 14. So it's directed against the Jews. Even a marvellous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. So you can see clearly there are references and language very much like we've looked at in Habakkuk chapter 1. Now just before we go, one other thing. In verse 20, just make a, a, a mental note of this, we've got, and the scorner is consumed. Okay, so there were scorners at the time. Verse 22 of chapter 28, which we read, Now therefore be not mockers, same word. And turn back to, chapter, uh, to verse 14, which we haven't read. Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem. So at this time, whatever Isaiah was prophesying against may be the situation in his own day, talking about judgments coming upon God's people. They were mockers and scorners, those that cast doubt on and mocked the words of the Lord and the words of the prophets. So I'd like us to just keep that in mind when we go to Acts chapter 13. Now Acts chapter 13 is the time when the Apostle Paul Paul and Barnabas are preaching. Um, they're clearly going to the Gentiles. Um, Cornelius has already happened. And they are going to the Gentiles, but they're still first going to the synagogues. And even though they shake the dust of their feet when they're in Antioch in Pisidia here, against them because of their refusal to listen. They still go. We find them going into synagogues to first of all preach to the Jews. But there is clearly a movement away, isn't there? Even in the Gospels and then in the Acts of the Apostles, a movement away from Jews to Gentiles because Jews refuse to hear Gentiles 
were willing to hear the words of God. So, Acts chapter 13, Paul's preaching in the synagogue, and he's going through and giving them lots of information from the Old Testament, and he finishes his, his, um, his speech, I was just about to say sermon, but perhaps that's not a good word to use. He finishes his, his, his address here in, in verse 39, 30, 30, 40. Uh, Beware therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. And now he quotes Habakkuk. Behold, he despises and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And then the Jews go to the synagogue, the Gentiles say, well, that was a great speech there. Can you tell us more next, next time, next Saturday? And so they all command, the whole the place is all full, there are people wanting to hear. And that stirs up the Jews to be envious, and they speak against Paul and Barnabas. They contradict him, and this is when Paul um, says in verse 46, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it far from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Quoting then uh, that he should be a light unto the Gentiles, that he was continuing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then, verse 51, they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came to Iconium. So they went away from uh, Antioch in, in Pisidia. So what about this quotation then from, from Habakkuk? It's very directly related to the Chaldeans in Habakkuk, isn't it? And, and clearly it's being used here to show to the Jews that God judged his people before because they wouldn't listen to his words and so God is quite capable of doing the same thing again and he warns them beware therefore lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets it's not saying there that what was spoken in the prophets didn't happen um, he's saying that what might come upon you if you don't listen is going to be similar to that which is there written in the, in the prophets and he's quoting from Habakkuk but you can see that there are differences in the quotation. Now, how do we reconcile that? There's a number of ways in which you could do that. The normal way for Christadelphians to do this is, in my opinion, not right. What Christadelphians do, and you read this in books, and I suggest you beware of this, what they do is they say, well, Paul is quoting from the Greek version of the Hebrew Scriptures known as the Septuagint, except there is no Septuagint. There's different versions of it. So there's no one single version of, of it. And it's, it's a, to me, a crazy idea to think that the Apostle Paul and others who quote from the Old Testament are going to quote from a, a translation which we know is suspect. And we know it's very different in its text from the Hebrew Scriptures, they're going to quote directly from the Hebrew. Now that gives us a problem, really, doesn't it? Because when we look at it and we say, well, what, is it in, well, what does it look like in Habakkuk? And what does it look like in Acts? And there are a few differences. When you look more closely, those, those differences begin to evaporate and, and you get a, a picture that is, is a little bit different in first sight. Because if you remember, you've got a translation of the Hebrew into English in Habakkuk. You've got another translation from the Greek into English in Acts. And you have to allow for the fact that one or both of those translations might not be absolutely perfect, so you need to look carefully at the words that are there. So we might want to just quickly compare and just pick up the, uh, the differences that are there. So here we need to turn to two places at the same time. So we're already in Acts, and we need to go back to Habakkuk and just to see what we've got here as differences. Generally there's not very much in the way of differences when you start to, to look at it, but let's, let's just see. We've got the word behold, that seems straightforward enough, and then it says ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvellously. That's in Habakkuk, but now we've got something different. Behold ye despisers and wonder and perish. So the big difference there I think is, is the reference to despisers and, uh, and Habakkuk, of course, has got ye among the heathen. Um, and then we've got the, the idea about a worker work in your days, a work which you'll no wise believe. 
is pretty much the same in both. So you allow there for slight differences in the translation. Um, you don't have the word man in Habakkuk, uh, which you will not believe, though it be told you. There's no reference to man in Habakkuk. There's no reference to man in the Greek either. So that's not a, a particularly brilliant translation. The word man isn't there. Um, so so it's, it's clear at the end. So you've got these... This, this reference to despisers, which I seem to think is, is perhaps the most difficult bit. What, what is Paul here doing? Well, I don't actually think he's quoting Habakkuk verbatim. I believe what he's doing is he's quoting two prophets. And that seems to be what we're told. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. You get quotations, don't you, sometimes, as it is spoken by the prophet Isaiah or whoever. You know, he's saying, beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. So we've got possibly possibility of two prophets. Now, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, but I want to just show you what I think it might be. And I think he's quoting from Isaiah as well as Habakkuk. We've already looked at it, but we'll come back, go back to it in a minute. But I want to show you in the very same chapter the kind of thing that verse 41 might be about. Because in verse 22, in the very same chapter, you've got Paul referring to the Old Testament. And when he had removed him, at Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom he also gave testimony. Now, where in the Old Testament do you have the next bit that follows? And said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Where is that in the Old Testament? It's not in any one place. Those words can be found in four different places in the Old Testament. So there's an example of quotations being brought together by the Apostle, Without him actually stating they came from this place and that place, there's a quotation from Psalm 89, Isaiah 11, 1 Samuel 13, and Psalm 40 in that little section there. And you've got those four quotations, little bits taken. A definition of a quotation is a fragment of scripture reproduced in later scripture. If you keep that in mind, it's not my definition, it's Arthur Gibson's, but it's very, very useful. A fragment of scripture reproduced in later scripture. Fragment can be just one word. So that's how important one words are in, in the scripture. And, and you can trace that back if you want to. So I think we've got something similar here. And I think the idea of um, despise in, in the Greek here, this is according to Vine, is one who thinks down against. Okay, so you are effectively looking at what somebody said and you don't hold it in high regard at all. You're thinking down against it. In other words, you're mocking and you're scorning, aren't you? You're scorning what's being said. And so I wonder whether, because of the similarity of ideas in Isaiah 28 and 29, to those in Habakkuk, that what you've got is two bits of the Old Testament being quoted here. Two fragments. One from Isaiah and one from Acts. And probably... The, the reference is from Isaiah 28, verse 14, I would suggest. As I say, I'm not dogmatic about it, but I think that that's a possible explanation as to why there is a difference, um, or a, a major difference, in what we read in Habakkuk 1, verse 5, and Acts 13, 41. So where I would suggest it's taken from is the idea of um, scornful men in verse 14. Um, of Isaiah 28. The idea of scornful has the same kind of idea as despisers. And I already mentioned, didn't I, that uh, you've got this emphasis on mockers in um, verse 22 of the same chapter and um, verse 20 um, of chapter 29, all the same word, okay, or root word. So we'll just leave that for now, and no doubt you might have thoughts on, on that. So I um, wanted to just quickly look at um, 
at Proverbs 29, uh, and then we just look very quickly at the last few verses. So in Proverbs 29, and we're considering now the bad rule of Jehoiakim again. Uh, it's, it's a general comment in Proverbs, but it's applicable to people like Jehoiakim. And in Proverbs 29 then and verse 2, uh, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. That's what it was like when Josiah, sorry, Jehoiakim was on the throne. And then in verse 7, the righteous considereth the cause of the poor. Now Josiah did, he considered the poor and needy. But the wicked regardeth not to know it. Scornful men bring a city into a snare. And look what the margin says there. That's interesting, isn't it? Scornful men. So I've got the same idea here. Scornful men bring a city into a snare. And the margin says, set a city on fire. Well, that's what happened to Jerusalem. It was burned by fire. Scornful men bring a city into a snare. Same word is in Isaiah 28, by the way. But wise men turn away wrath. So, terrible judgments were to come upon the... Uh, nation of Israel as a result of disobedience and the fact that they didn't turn from their ways. So just finally then, looking quickly now at the last few verses in, in Habakkuk, and before we close, so Habakkuk chapter 1, um, and um, we haven't really got time to turn up some references now, but I'm going to refer to a few scriptures that we will probably um, be aware of. So we, what we've had is Habakkuk questioning why things aren't happening. God saying, well, it's going to happen. He's going, and this is how it's going to happen. These are the people that will be executing my judgments. Um, I haven't had time to comment on verse 11, but maybe there's certain things there about Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and it's interesting to contrast, actually, those two kings, Nebuchadnezzar and Jehoiakim. And, and surprisingly, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, whilst it takes him a little while to get sorted, uh, there's lots of good things that he does, whereas Jehoiakim, there's nothing good that he does. One sh was on the throne of David, one was not. And you would expect it to be the other way around, but it wasn't. So then we find in verse 12, then Habakkuk is, is replying now, and he is saying, to God, art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God? And that's probably referring to Psalm 90. God is from everlasting and to everlasting. Uh, o Lord my God, mine holy one, we shall not die. So he's looking to see if there's some kind of way maybe of escape from all of this. And then he realizes, O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. So he recognizes that like the Assyrian of old, so the Chaldeans were to execute the judgments of God. And, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. It was all for good reason that people of Israel might learn the lesson, not to go astray. And, and that's what we need to learn, that be the lesson. We can't just do what we like. We can't just go and, and, and uh, do exactly what we like and please ourselves. That won't please God. We've got to think about what God wants from us. And... And then he um, goes on to, to use this figure of the, the, um, the catching of the people um, as the Chaldeans were going to be like fishers, fishing the people and putting them in a, uh, catching them from all ways, from yeah, the hook, the net, and then the drag, it says, or oh, that would have been a different sort of net. Therefore they rejoice and they are glad. So that brings then Habakkuk to to ask this question, shall they therefore, in verse 17, empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? Well, the answer to that, of course, is given in chapter 2, but it's also given in Jeremiah chapter 25, isn't it? That, that this judgment that's being brought is not just to be brought on Habakkuk, uh, on the, the Jews, as Habakkuk says here, but as Jeremiah says in chapter 25, which we haven't got time to turn to, there's a whole list there of many, many nations to whom Jeremiah had to go around with a cup of wine and get them to drink 
cup of wine. And that was symbolic of the fact that judgment would come upon all the nations and the people doing the judging would be the Babylonians for a period of 70 years. And then it says afterwards that the king of Shishak, a cipher for Babylon, shall drink after them. So, in uh, maybe more detail, whoever is to look at chapter 2 will be able to answer Habakkuk's question here in verse 17, God willing, next week. <clears throat>